Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all, and uh, thanks, big thanks for the organizers <clears throat> for the timing of this conference, which come with the uh, 30th anniversary of the Child Rights Convention. Before I came here last week, I was in Geneva for the international uh, movement, the Defense Fortune International around the world. We met about uh, 50 sections from uh, the, fifth, uh, the five uh, continents, from Latin America, from uh, North America, from uh, Europe, uh, Africa, uh, and Asia. And uh, when we discussed uh, the children's situation in uh, uh, the sections, we discovered that, unfortunately, the situation in the Middle East uh, is the worst in the world. And in the past, we used to talk only about Palestine, but now we are talking about Yemen and uh, Syria, Iraq. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, we uh, discuss in depth uh, the roots of the problems you easily find that uh, America, U.S. Uh, administration is behind all these uh, uh, catastrophes. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, the situation of the rights of the child in Palestine. So, uh, the main rights that mentioned, or the fundamental, fundamental rights that mentioned in the Child Rights Convention is violated uh, in systematic way and in sometimes in daily uh, life. Uh, if we talk about right to, the, to right to life, which is a very uh, fundamental right and should be protected in any circumstances, uh, I don't like to talk about children in uh, numbers because each child is a good story, but unfortunately the, time, the, the number of the children who was killed or lost their lives is a huge number. Uh, since 2000 until now we documented uh, the killing of 2,100 th children killed by the Israeli soldiers and settlers uh, in different uh, places around the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Last uh, re war attacks against Gaza, I don't want to say war against Gaza, attacks against Gaza, uh, hundreds of children were killed, like in 2014, 555 children killed during the attacks uh, for in, during 50 days of uh, attacks on Gaza. Uh, the last uh, attacks, which is uh, last week, eight children were killed among, I think, 34 uh, uh, adults or civilians killed. So uh, this right is violated every day. When you talk about 2,100 children killed, this means that tens of thousands of children were injured some of them become handicapped and lost uh, some of their organs. Uh, right uh, to education is violated. Uh, just last year, we start, uh, this year, we started to document in details the uh, violation to right to education. Uh, we found that we concentrate on 120 uh, schools, which we call it the targeted schools, in the old city in Hebron, near the bypass roads. Uh, near the settlements, near the wall. So uh, some schools in Delhi, uh, they, they were attacked by the soldiers, by the settlers like uh, Kurtuba and uh, uh, Dar al I think, uh, not Dar al Kurtuba school, especially, the, which is in the old city. I don't, I think maybe you, saw, you visited it, uh, this school. It's inside the old city is surrounded by the settlers and the soldiers, and every child would like to enter should be uh, searched by the soldiers, and again, when you get back, so terrible situation. I visited the old city before, in 1996, and uh, after, uh, there were there more than 30,000 people living there without settlers, but later on, the settlers come. Now there is, I think, less than 400 settlers, uh, protected uh, with more than 500 soldiers. Uh, those soldiers, not only to protect the, uh, the settlers, 
but mostly to uh, complicate the life of the Palestinians, arresting the, uh, the Palestinians in the same area. Settlers are subject to the Israeli civil court, uh, civil system, uh, civil legal system, while the Palestinians are under the jurisdiction of the military uh, jurisdiction. So the soldiers have no authority to uh, arrest or to prosecute the, uh, the, the settlers, only the police, but uh, their role is to punish the Palestinians and to arrest the Palestinians even when they try to defend uh, their themselves. So uh, this is about uh, right to education, about uh, child uh, prisoners issue, uh, which is our main focus. Uh, we worked in this field since 1991. Myself, I worked as a defense lawyer in the Israeli military court for about 20 years. Uh, really, it's maybe my colleague will talk more about uh, this issue from his yeah, experience. But myself, uh, I felt that at the end of the, the, the work, especially the last 10 years of working after uh, being in the court for more than 10 hours every day, five days a week, I start to feel that I'm part of the system. The, legal, uh, the Israeli military legal system is designed, and I use the word design, to punish, not to obtain any kind of justice. So uh, in, this, in these military courts, only military orders are applied. Uh, and if we go back to uh, what uh, Gideon mentioned yesterday, that uh, they were talking about temporary uh, occupation, uh, in 1967, after the occupation, directly they established or they published the military order, I think, 35, which talked about the military orders, but if there is any kind of contradiction between the uh, military orders and the Geneva Convention, the first Geneva Convention, Geneva Convention should be applied. But it works only one month or two months, and then they change it. So now the military orders only are applied there. So to arrest a child in the middle of the night, uh, interrogate him in the middle of the night uh, without a lawyer, without legal consultation, is according to the law, is legal. To deny a child from uh, seeing the lawyer or consultant, consultant with the lawyer is uh, legal. So being in this, in this system is, uh, I can say that uh, your hand is cuffed as a lawyer. And sometimes you have to forget your legal background, and you have to work as a mediator between the, uh, the child and the prosecutor in order to solve the case, instead of uh, resisting the procedures in the court. Because if you would like to go to challenge the, the, the system, maybe the court will take more than one year while you can uh, uh, limited the time or in the, the case by do kind of bargain within three, four months and to sentence the child to be released after six, seven months instead of uh, challenging the system and uh, waste uh, more than one year in prison. Mm -hmm. And for those who we try to ask for uh, a release on bail, uh, usually more than 90% will be uh, refused. So when I said it's designed, to punish, I can say that uh, this system is also, also uh, in addition to punish, also to legitimate the Israeli crimes and the practices uh, in the ground. So in many cases, I try to convince the court through my, uh, my statements and my, uh, uh, the witnesses that I try to ask uh, to, to bring to the court uh, usually, they believe the soldiers more than the child himself or any, uh, any witness. One of the cases, which is an interesting case, I forgot uh, the name of the case exactly, but what happened that the child was under pressure, he was tortured, and uh, the interrogator was uh, Israeli and they speak broken Arabic language. So uh, he interrogated the child and he wrote everything in Hebrew. And then the child signed it, and they present it to the prosecutor. The prosecutor uh, prepared the list of charges. And when I read the file, I found that the child is not signing the document. The child is writing in Arabic, I'm, sign I'm signing under pressure. <laughs> 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 so.
So I ask the interrogator to come to the court to investigate the case. So I asked him how you interrogate the child. He said that he was uh, uh, dealing with him in a very uh, uh, good way. I offered him cigarette. I told him cigarette is forbidden for children. <laughs> so uh, I offered him uh, tea, water, and he was uh, nice with me, and I was nice with him. I uh, asked him, and he answered. I wrote in Hebrew, and I and, uh, translated it to him, and he signed, and this is the case. I told him, how is your Arabic? He said, very good. <laughs> so what is written here? He said, yeah, his name is uh, Muhammad something. Okay, there is a translator in the court. I asked the translator to read what is written there. He said, it is, I'm signing under pressure. Even that, the judge, because there is some uh, other confessions uh, uh, testimonies from soldiers, he, uh, the judge decided that he is guilty and uh, uh, convicted the child of throwing stones in that time. And he did kind of favor for with me to release the child on that day, not after three months. But uh, myself, I was care more about, uh, about uh, how to, to, uh, to shorten the period of prison more than to challenge the system with this case. Because for the children, one day is in prison is like one year, as usually they said. So being in the court, <clears throat> in this military court, uh, it's kind of big challenge. Your hand is cuffed. The expectation of the child and his family is big. While I know uh, uh, the percentage, how I can, the limited uh, work that I can do. So most of the cases, I said, as I said, uh, finished by plea bargain, uh, communication with the prosecutor and to delete some of ch the charges and to, to agree in a certain uh, period of prison and the thing. So by the time I start to feel that I become part of the system, because sometimes I believe that the child is innocent. Even if he gave a confession, it is unrealistic confession. Like some of the children gave a confession that I throw stones last two months, 200 times. I asked the judge, can you tell me how many times you came to the court uh, last month? He said, five, uh, four, weeks a day, uh, four, four weeks a month, five days a week, 20. It's not like this. I told them, maybe you've been sick, maybe there is holidays. How you believe the child that he throws stones 200 times in two months? So, oh, let's say many times. So it is not like this because since you are going to, to send the people, uh, child to the prison, you have to be sure that he... So it's like working in with two faces. From the first side, I believe that the child is innocent. Even if he participates in throwing stones, if he uh, participates in a demonstration against the occupation, he's practicing his right to expression. But according to the military system, and being in the military system, you have to work according to the rules in the, co in the system, and those who are throwing stones is a subject uh, according to the military, law, military order for a prison. If he throws stones for something moving like a car, the maximum is 20 years in a prison. And if he throws stones for something, uh, house or something not moving, it's uh, 10 years. So when they agreed with us as the lawyers to finish the file with five months in prison, yeah, he is doing a big favor uh, with the child, and then they accept it. So uh, this is uh, maybe this is one of the main things that I decided to stop being in the court. Another uh, reason also, like I worked with children, I start to work with children the age of my kids, my children. So uh, it's difficult to accept to see a child uh, with the clothes, business clothes, like adults but he is like one and a half meters with the big clothes and uh, shocked all the time. And sometimes uh, used to uh, catch me from my jacket, please uncle, don't leave me alone, they will kill me. So many times I was attacked in the court because I hugged the child uh, when he was crying. So it's damaged really, psychologically I was damaged psychologically. So I decided to stop being there because also I have become like kind of aggressive on my children. When they ask me to go to a restaurant or to go, I direct, I refuse because 
I left children behind uh, bars without any care, without a family, and why you would like to go to restaurant. Or so I stopped and I came to Ireland. I studied international human rights law. And I was not that much aware about the international law, especially <coughs> the uh, Child Rights Convention and the uh, International Covenant on Political Rights. So I, go, I went back to the court. I told them, the judges, I, I know that we have to be here to be with the children for the best interest of the children, but you are committing war crimes and crimes against humanity, I, and don't want to be more uh, in this place. So they told me it is your right, but we will continue. So uh, back to the military court system, after I can say that after 40 years of the occupation, they decided to establish what they call it the juvenile military court. After a criticism from the international level, and then they decide to do that, uh, and they try to present it as a kind of applying the international uh, juvenile justice standards by having a juvenile court. And in a very rude way, maybe you know him, uh, Benicio, the head of the appeal military court, he called me while I was not being there or appealing there in the court. He told me that we decide to respect what you were talking about, and now we are going to establish juvenile court. So we asked you to come to give a speech in the opening session of the court. <laughs> so I told him, I welcome your eye. First of all, it's good that after 40 years of incubation, you remember that you were violating the rights of the children, and now you are going to uh, establish juvenile military court. But since you are talking about juvenile military court, this means that nothing will be changed. So uh, I can come when the ceremony of the closing of the military court system, and then I can give a speech and then can celebrate with you. Uh, in that time, they used to give me a permission to go to, to visit and uh, to do my work. But after that time, I was denied entering uh, Israel. So uh, as uh, my colleague before uh, talked, uh, still the Israeli uh, military uh, court works. And uh, the number of the children who are arrested and persecuted in the military court are sometimes increasing, especially since 2015 until now. Uh, no different at all between, uh, between the juvenile military court and the military court, only at ICON, I can say that it's kind of cosmetics for the system. Change hats. Only the judge, when the child in front of him considered as a juvenile judge, but when the child get out, the court will continue as uh, usual. The same place, the same rooms even, the same prosecutor, the same, uh, that's nothing change, only it's kind of propaganda to uh, market it in the international level, level that they are executing according to the international standards. So now more than 500 uh, yearly arrested and persecuted in military courts, just in the West Bank. Uh, but in Jerusalem, they persecuted the children in the Israeli civil courts. But the number of the children who are arrested from Jerusalem sometimes uh, more than the children from the West Bank. Jerusalem is targeted. Uh, every day there is arresting, and uh, even they create what they call it the, how, uh, the home arrest, like arresting the child, and in the court they release him on diff uh, many conditions, and one of them, home arrest. And in this way, and it seems that they are applying the international standards, which is the alternatives, but in fact it is a, a big punishment to the family, not only the child. Sometimes they force the family to open a new house. If they are living in the old city in, in Jerusalem, sometimes they ask them to open in another neighborhood uh, house or in uh, other uh, city, and then the family will be divided. And the role of the family, instead of protecting the child, they become like a prison guard for the child. So it's a very uh, difficult uh, uh, punishment, and the worst also, and now most of the family refuse it, 
because they do not account it as a part if he come back again to the court and sentence for a certain period of time, the time that he spent in home arrest is not accounted uh, in the punishment. So it's uh, like double punishment for the same charge. This is, uh, I'd, so good that uh, yesterday my colleague Samah talked about uh, the uh, psychological effect, uh, effects of the children, but uh, really sometimes the children, they do not know that they are subject to a systematic uh, uh, way of how to control the child and how to damage uh, the protection system of the child and how to interfere in his psychological uh, building. Like, if you look for the way that they have they arrested the children, most of the children arrested from their houses, and very few, uh, in, uh, by calling them, may be the case of Ahmad. But when they called the child to come by phone to call the father, they did it in a very terrible way in order to to, to, to terrorize the child and the family, and maybe he'll talk about his case. I'm going to talk about the home arrest. Like, all the Cuba territory is under the occupation. Regardless, there is A, B, C areas according to Oslo Gordons, but now it does not exist. Near, uh, in the neighborhood of the president, they can come and arrest. Most of the arrest campaigns happened uh, from 2 a.m. morning until 3, 4 a.m. So I interviewed Many children uh, who've been in the prison, that most of them they told me we couldn't sleep before 2 a.m. because we expect every day, every night they will come. And when I asked them where you would like to, uh, to sleep, they said in a room with a window to see if the soldiers are coming because they, we, they don't want to be waked up by the soldiers with the machine gun and to, to, to start interrogating them during uh, before and yeah, when they wake them up. So it's kind of atmosphere of uh, terrorization and to, put, to, to let the child feel that this is the start and you don't know what will happen with you in the uh, coming steps. Like taking the child in the middle of the night for interrogation, within a few hours sometimes they obtain a confession. As I mentioned, it is sometimes uh, clear that, uh, clear, uh, that uh, it is unrealistic that sometimes give the arrest of the uh, <coughs> classmate of the, uh, of the child, to give him the names just because he would like to finish. Uh, sometimes give the names of the family, sometimes uh, say something unrealistic. And many times we manage to, uh, to convince or to uh, prove that this uh, confession is unrealistic because the child, he gave a confession about children while they are in that time in prison. So how you believe them? Did you investigate if the uh, confession is realistic or no? No. My job is to obtain the, the confession, and this is the work of the court. So the court usually is like a stamp, legal stamp. So I can compare all the military, uh, military uh, court system is like a factory. The cow enter in the morning, normal cow enter and get out from the, uh, the, the other uh, <coughs> door, uh, meet with a legal uh, signal stamp that it is uh, f valid for uh, food. And the child get in the morning, enter the court, innocent, get out guilty with punishment, who you knows. Just one word about the judges in the military court. The judges, judges in the military court, <coughs> Those who are sentenced Palestinians for hundreds of years in prison, uh, they are not qualified to be judges in Israel. I know one of the judges, he used to be the head of the court in Nablus, the military court of Nablus, Shuki Halevi, I know his name, because he was very aggressive and uh, doubles the sentence against the Palestinians. After a long time, he became a traffic judge in Israel. So here you can see the value of the, the Israeli vision about uh, the Palestinian. The Palestinian is maybe citizens or human in third class or fourth part class. But those judges are not qualified enough to, be, to deal with the life of the Israelis. So they consider them are not judges. Even sometimes, once I think they appealed to the, uh, the petition to the Israeli Supreme Court 
for their salaries and for the, <coughs> their uh, level that they, why you do not consider us as judges while we work more than judges in the civil system. I think they solve it by raising their uh, salaries and then they draw off that, uh, the, the petition. So again, this system is to punish and to legitimate without any kind of justice. And I, can, I close with uh, the words that uh, the Israeli brave lawyer, I think she passed away last year, Elisa Langer, she wrote when she decided to boycott the system, she said that after 24 years of working in this disgusting system, I decided to boycott the system because basically there is no rights for the Palestinian. So myself, I decided uh, it was not easy for me to take a decision. Even when, while I was in Ireland, I met the South African ambassador. She used to be a lawyer in the apartheid system. And I told her my, about my feeling being the court in this court. She told me, you have to choose to be with the victims in this hard time or to leave them alone challenging the system. So she told me that herself, she decided to continue. But really, myself, I couldn't. But now I'm managing the organization. We have lawyers who are doing there. I hope they will manage the one who replaced me. Now he is in the 13, 11 years working there. I hope he will manage to continue another in order to find another one to replace him. Because it's difficult for a lawyer who is working with his feeling, not as a business, to continue work there. Thank you very much. Hi, so yeah, uh, coming after a giant. Um, <laughs> so when Khaled left, I came in. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, well, I've been representing the court uh, for a decade. And I, I have to admit to you all, I also left. Yeah, uh, I left because I left Israel. I took my uh, nine-year-old twins and I looked for another country to live. So I'm currently living in Ireland. But yeah, it was a, uh, the decade ended just a couple of years ago, so it's still very in my blood, and I'm still very much connected to the office in Israel and trying to do as much as I can to help. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of the experience of being a lawyer in the military courts. I'm, I'm going to try to talk today about something a little bit different. I'm going to first talk a little bit about why. Why are they arresting so many children? Uh, when you go and you are alive in this system, and I believe Khaled will agree with me, you meet people, you meet Israeli judges, and you meet Israeli prosecutors, and they are humans. Yes. Yeah, none of them is really, well, there are a few that are inherently evil, but uh, most of them are just humans, like all of us here, and they have children, and they have families, and they, have, and they are interested in the things that you are interested in. They are much more in common than you would like to believe in that. And, and you wonder how and why humans will do that. <laughs> Other humans that you meet and talk and, and you know, and Especially when you do, a, the, the court is a bit um, kind of an intimate court. Not a lot of people are coming to the court. It's the same people that come day after day, and the uh, judges will ask the lawyer, the Palestinian lawyers, how are you, and how was the wedding of your child, and there will be a discussion. And they, they, everybody is, is actually working together there in a way. So, And I was all the time bothered because those the questions that... Khaled raised about do we cooperate, do we not cooperate, what do we do there, why does it happen? So I always wanted to look at a bit wider. So why did we arrest so many children? Well, they arrest so many children because it's effective. It's work, it works for them very good. Israel is holding uh, with military occupation, the, the, the West Bank, let's talk about the West Bank, for more than 50 years now, with very little price to pay, financially, economically, military. And because it's a very wise system, it's understood very quickly, very 
much in the beginning, who do you need to target in order that a real rebel force will not arise? Because if all the Palestinians will just have said no, it's enough, and they will go to the street, and it will be a, a, a daily giant demonstration, Israel cannot cope with it. Not without doing atrocities that it doesn't feel like uh, being filmed and watched all over the world. So they understood very quickly that uh, it is the young that they need to target. And it's not just every young. If you look at who are the children that are going to the prisons, those are the children that live near settlements. Uh, most of the children in the big cities that are under kind of mostly control of the Palestinian Authority uh, are not targeted by the army, usually. 90% of the children live less than a mile from a settlement. 90% of the children that are in prisons live less than a mile from a settlement. And this is the army job in the West Bank. The army job in the West Bank has become, it wasn't like that just at the beginning, but it had become to keep the life of the settlers in the settlements as happy and safe as they, it could be. This is what the, it's the job of the army. And the army is a machine that works. And it said, how do I do that? I need that no one will bother the, the, the settlers. Now, the settlers are a real bother to every Palestinian village that they are near. Yeah, it, they are expanding, they are taking more land, they are closing more roads. So it's, every settlement is suffocating the Palestinian village near it. So of course the Palestinian village has an aggression against the settlement. But uh, in order to make the settlement, uh, the, the, the village uh, subdue, you need to find a way to kill it morally, spiritually. And this is how you do it. You take the children. Because the children are the energy of a village. The children are, uh, they, they have hope. They have a real enthusiasm about them. And they are a bit stupid, as every teenager is. Yeah? And that's what makes them so dangerous. Because they are willing to take risks that adults already do not want to take because they have families and they have jobs. And they, and they, could, they are the ones that give the spirit of a fight to a village. So very quickly the Palestinians, the, the, the military has understood that in order to, to do that, you just take the, the children and then the children that after they are dealt in that machine that Khaled uh, described, they are no longer the same children. They are afraid. They're they have now also a suspended sentence. If they will get caught again, they will get to a, a much longer time in prison. And we as lawyers, we want them to, to sit as little as they can in prison. So we agree to a very long extension, uh, extent of, of, of arrest if they will be arrested again. So we are helping in that sense in, 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 in making them more fearful. So it works. <coughs> It works for them really good. Think about, uh, it's always terrible to, to say, and, and, and kind of talked about the amount of, of children that were killed, and people that were killed, but still it's nothing. Think about it, it nothing, because the, 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 the legal military system is so effective that it's not a real big number of deaths in order to control millions of people we, 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 without rights. Think about Americans taking uh, half a million Americans and putting them in Afghanistan and now need to keep them. Do you know how many Afghans will be dead in order to keep those uh, half a million uh, Americans alive? So in a way that system worked for Israel, minimum deaths in, the, in their eyes. Uh, we are using a legal system. Everything is working. And then the other question is, if those people are people, as I said, and they are people, 
how come the, how come they are agreeing to take part of it? What, how, but you have children in your home, yeah, and you are coming to work, and there is another child. So where, where is how does it work? And and for that I, I will tell, I think one case that I had that just explained the whole thing. That well, this case has kind of opened my eyes finally to the fact that no one, no one in the system sees children. They don't see children there. They see Palestinians, terrorists, stone throwers, but they cannot see them as children. So I will not give the name. He's a minor. He's still a minor. For your, uh, let's call him Ronan or Sean or some <laughs> Irish name, so you can imagine him in... So Ronan wanted to go to the swimming pool. It was summer 2016. And he didn't have money to go to the swimming pool near Hebron. So he had a, a brilliant teenager plan. He will go, and it was still some uh, grapes from the vineyard of the settlement. And then he will go to the road, he will sell it, he will have money to go to the pool, he will go to the pool. Sounds perfect. So he went to, 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 the, to the vineyard to pick some grapes from the settlement vineyard. He entered, and he started picking them, and you pick them with a small knife. For his bad luck, uh, an army patrol was there, passing, and one of the soldiers wanted to pee. So they said, go into the vineyard, and let's pee there. And they went to the vineyard, and they went to pee, and he was hiding be, be between the, the, the grapes, and the, one of the soldiers heard something, and he saw something between the grapes. So he aimed his rifle and said, get out. And Ronan came out, and he said, lift your hand. And he was lifting your hand, and he has a small knife in his hand. And this is 2016. Israelis are hysterical. The, the Palestinians are stabbing them all over the, the, the West Bank. So there is a, a terrible hysteria at the situation. And two other soldiers are coming with rifles, and Ronan is standing, let's say, near the fire extinguisher with a knife. And he's 14 years old, and he's maybe that height. And there are three soldiers with rifles aiming at him, shouting at him in the Hebrew, because nobody speaks Arabic, and he doesn't understand what they're shouting. And he's taking the knife down and he starts crying. And they don't know what to do. And one of the soldiers is very aggressive and he starts shouting at him in Hebrew, drop the knife, drop the knife. And he raised the knife in the hands again. And in, in fear he said the terrible words. Allahu Akbar. Oh, short. Yeah. And he throw the knife aside and he turn around and they shoot him in the back. Uh, one bullet in the back and one bullet in the, in, in the back of the leg. And those soldiers did not, did not see a child. No, there was no child in front of them. There was a, a Palestinian terrorist. And then comes, it's, it's, near, it's near the settlements, all the security forces are coming, and comes the ambulance, and there's a bit of video from that there, and you see that while there is a, someone who is a, kind of taking care of his wounds, there is already a military officer shouting at him, why did you try to stab soldiers? And that, of course, officer did not see a child. And he goes into the ambulance with a policeman, and they go to a, an Israeli hospital in Jerusalem, and he goes into the hospital, and, he's, and they put, put him in emergency, and he says he has a few operations. He's, all his knees crashed uh, totally. The bones are crashed totally. He cannot. Then yeah, they put all kind of things in it, metals, and then he goes out of the operation, barely moving. And the policeman is insisting, of course, to put a handcuff 
to his bed, to handcuff him to his bed, because he obviously could run away from the hospital. And he does that because he doesn't see a child. And also the hospital. Nobody think about calling his parents, asking him what the what, what, what your parents the, the parents are heard about the things they are running from one place to another. The police doesn't tell them where he is. The hospital doesn't tell them. Where he is. Nobody knows where he is. This is where the, the lovely work of a lawyer starts when he starts to make calls and the, and the police lie to him and they don't tell. Then everybody do, do not tell him where Then you need to start to run away. And, but that was not me, that was another lawyer that was trying to find him. I was in the military court two days after, after that, just walking around between cases. And the president of the court came to me and said, there's an ambulance there here with a, a, with, with a Palestinian suspect. We need to do an arrest, an extension of arrest to him. Let's do it in the ambulance, he told me. What, what, what do you mean, let's do it in the ambulance? He said, we, the ambulance says it's not good to move him so much. Yeah? So I'm, I'm saying I, I need to, to see what it is. I'm going into that ambulance together with the president of the military court, and he brings uh, someone that will type a, a protocol, and we are in the ambulance, and I said, what are you talking about? Uh, what is the, the procedure? He said, leave him, he's in an Israeli hospital at the moment, what do you care? I will extend his arrest for a few days, and then, then we'll see. And of course, no, I'm, I'm not playing that game. I, I object and I would, do not agree to that, but thank you very much. Okay, uh, everything is written and, uh, and there is an extension of arrest. Now, meanwhile, the army need to make excuses for what happened. So the soldier that, saw, that shot him is, is giving a statement saying, I felt life-threatened, he, he threw the knife at me shouting Allahu Akbar, I had to shoot him. And the, the police is, of course, interrogating the uh, Ronin, and without parent, without lawyer, without anything. But Ronin is telling the truth, saying what happened. Yeah. And because it's an hospital and there is a, I don't think the police felt very comfortable to start shouting at him and, and try to do this. So they have, and actually, the. The, there was another soldier there, there were three, so there was another soldier there saying everything that that soldier said is true, that is his testimony, and the third soldier is not questioned at all. Nobody is talking to him. And of course the police, because they do not see a child, believe soldier, soldier said, it's finished, easy case, yeah, well, no worries here. And they bring him again to court, not this time to keep him in remand, to keep him to the rest of the proceeding in prison. Because it's a very serious offense that he is charged with an attempted murder. This is what they charge him with. Attempted murder. It's for, for a minor, it could be a few years in prison. And they bring him to the court and he cannot walk, so they bring him in a stretch. And it's already beginning of uh, autumn, and it's, uh, that day it was raining, and the stretcher doesn't get inside the court. So he's outside of the court, in a stretcher, in the rain, while we are having the discussion about his fate outside, inside the court. And I'm saying to the court, I'm not talking when my client is outside, in the rain, and uh, you do not even see him. Yes? But he's saying, I cannot enter him. What, what do you want? I can just extend his arrest without you. So I argue and I said, okay, 
everything okay. Let's say he is the most dangerous murderer in the world. He cannot walk. He has a, a bullet here and a bullet here. What is the risk? What is the risk? Let him heal and then bring him to court. And the, the judge say with a serious face, he is a flight risk. <laughs> and I, I, I get crazy and I say, yeah, he will wheel himself to Jordan. What, 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 what will happen? Yeah? And I, I got thro thrown out of court, but that's the decision. Because the judge who has children, they do not see in this child a child. And it continues, it goes to the appeal, and, and the, the very compassionate Benicio, yeah, I can see what you're saying, but it's a very dangerous felony, and uh, I cannot see a child, he's saying in brackets, I do not see a child in front of me, I see a terrorist. And we start court, and I ask the third soldier to come. And the third soldier saw a child, and he tells the court what happened. And, uh, and now the court is in problem. Two soldiers said like that, one soldier said like that, the, the child said like that. And then we come to the same problem. Come, come, come. Let's talk. We can get him home now. You don't want to get him home now? Otherwise, I need to hear more witnesses from the... the and they will... The, and yeah, and I ask the parents, and at the end, it's the parents, it's not us. And I ask the parents, do you want him to go home now, still convicted in an attempt of assault, or do you want to wait another half a year, I can get him out? I can acquit him. I can acquit him in a half a year, after a half a year in prison. And of course, the and I knew the answer, and I would do the same as a parent. Yeah? So the judge that knows, he knows that the child is lying. Because now the child needs to tell in court, in order for the plea bargain to happen, the child needs to tell in court a lie. That he tried to attack someone, and the, the, the court needed in order to approve. So everybody's doing a show. And it's all because they cannot see a child. And in that sense, that's why I will end here. The attempt to change the laws so the laws will be more related to human rights will not change the reality when you don't see children. Millions of, of, of youth courts and youth laws will not change it when you don't see children. And you don't see a children when there is such a bitter conflict between to nations, and this is the state of mind that they are in. So only ending it will will end the the suffering of the children. No cosmetics will end the, 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 the suffering of the children. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, I've worked, I'm um, retired child psychotherapist, I work in child and adolescent mental health. In child and adolescent mental health, we work a lot with children, young children and older children and their parents and their grandparents who are coming because the children who are referred to us are suffering from some kind, from some kind of serious disturbance. Um, uh, to get into child and adolescent mental health, you have to be pretty, sometimes there's a waiting list of three years, you have to, things have to be pretty tough. Now, one of the things that we have learned, that I learned, and some of my colleagues learned in our work, the children were referred, often people were looking for diagnostic categories, but we understood that what was happening, the reason why these children had problems was because of the context in which they were raised, the relationship that they were brought up in. And that often referred to the fact that there was disturbance with the parents as well. Uh, and what really helped us understand that link between the child and their parent was the concept of attachment, of emotional attachment. Uh, attachment has become a dominant paradigm now in, in child and adolescent mental health work. It's become a dominant paradigm in terms of trauma work. 
in, in our context. It is a much more important paradigm in terms of understanding how people, how people can be hurt and the damage that can, can be caused. It's a much more important model than, than the Freudian model. Uh, and I just want to say something very briefly, very quickly about that in a couple of seconds. Uh, attachment happens because a baby is only born with half a brain. 100 billion brain cells, most of them are not linked up. A baby is born with half a brain. What happens then, in the first couple of years of life, the human being is the only mama that this happens to. In the first couple of years of life, that brain starts to form. Those 100 billion brain cells make connections. And they make connections on the basis of the relationship that the baby is in. Fundamentally, the relationship with its carer. Uh, this is the attachment theory. Uh, it's about, and what happens in those couple of years, it's as if the 7 billion people in the world each had 20 mobile phones, and they were all using those mobile phones at the same time. That's the extent of the, the brain development that's taking place in those couple of years of life. And this creates attachment. Attachment gives us children the capacity to form relationships. It gives them the capacity for resilience. It enables them, it enhances their cognitive capacity. Uh, secure attachment can make a child 25% more cognitively functional than a child with an insecure attachment. has a massive impact on people's capacity for human relationships. And we understand now as a massive impact on physical health across the lifespan. So it's not just mental health, it's physical health. Um, we also know that trauma, a children being exposed to trauma, especially if it's ongoing trauma, severe ongoing constant stress, from the protector, the people who are supposed to be protecting you. We heard about this yesterday from Sama. Trauma can severely undermine that attachment security. So my fundamental hypothesis is this, that what is happening to Palestinian children uh, in terms of the occupation and the nighttime arrests and the, 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 the tyranny of the, the use of the military courts against children is designed in order to undermine the attachment security of these children the siblings who watch what happens to them, and the parents as well, the families as well. And it's even worse than that. It's even worse than that, because we now know from attachment theory and from trauma theory that traumatization like that there can actually be reproduced. Uh, we always knew that uh, of children, that, that, and attachment theory understood this about 30 years ago, uh, that, that people who are traumatized can pass it on to their offspring. We thought that was learned behavior because of the context that they were brought up in. But it's, we now have evidence, there's growing evidence, that this is happening uh, uh, in terms of the genes. It's been reproduced genetically. The DNA isn't being affected, but the, 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 the chemicals that change how DNA expresses itself is being affected. So there, there are, and we don't know if it's, there's theories that it's DNA, there's theories that it's RNA, and there's other models as well, but there's now emerging scientific evidence that trauma that happens, like in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Holocaust camps, like with the Confederate prisoners of war, with people who are subject to trauma, that that can be passed on to their offspring. And sometimes it can uh, skip a, a generation and affect the next generation. This is awful. This is appalling. And uh, my hypothesis is simply that this, is, this knowledge is known to Israeli expertise, to Israeli academic expertise, to people who work in the area of neurodevelopment, uh, people who work in the academy in Israel, that they're using this expertise to deliberately influence and design what happens in terms of the arrests and the interrogation and the biddings that we heard about. This is a very serious allegation. Uh, it's a very serious hypothesis, but what I'm saying to you here, but I've departed completely from my notes, uh, <laughs> what I'm saying to you here, that this is a very reasonable hypothesis to make. We already have people like Betty McCollum, a senator in the States who's got a bill going forward, saying that uh, Palestinian children are being deliberately traumatized. We know that. But what I'm saying is that this is a traumatization that's influenced by the academy, by research. It's well thought, thought out. It is the careful maiming of children. Um, and I can, if I can just finish by showing a little bit of this film. Uh, 
You know, we've heard about how Palestinians are dehumanised. We've heard that they're, if they're dehumanised, then you can do whatever you want to them. I just want to show you a couple of things here. This is a film made by an Israeli filmmaker, Yotam Feldman. Okay, I'm going to leave it there, folks. Uh, I just wanted to, that's a marvellous film by the Israeli director, Yotam Feldman. I recommend everybody to try and see it. Uh, it's horrific. The film really is about how uh, the Israeli arms industry is of the attacks on Gaza. The control of the Palestinian population, the occupation, is actually a massive money spinner for the Israeli economy. Every time there's an attack on Gaza, there's a spike in arms sales, and we saw a little bit of that there as well. But what was really striking about it is how they use these academic experts in order to advance the suppression of the Palestinian people, and we see that happening now in terms of children. Uh, so, uh, uh, you can't get it anymore. You used to be able to get it, but we've got to, we're trying to find a way to distribute it. But listen, folks, I want to thank you very much for that. I've You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ipsc.ie forward slash podcast. For more news, analysis, events, and ways in which you can take action, see our website at www.ipsc.ie. Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.